We warn about some of it here. We warn about it in the book. We knew there was surveillance. What's happened over these years is that there's been surveillance for almost a century in the United States. Uh, during, during World War, there, there are seats over here. Yeah, there's plenty of seats here. I'd like to bring in some more some seats over here. Yeah, there are seats. Uh, but American surveillance has become increasingly sophisticated over the years. Uh, if you, uh, the, the model that we sometimes use is the East German Stasi, the East German secret police. Their motto was to know everything about everybody. They couldn't do it. They were inept. They didn't have the technology. But the Stasi had one informer for every six people in East Germany. With our, me our present surveillance methods that Snowden and others have exposed, we now, with 37,000 employees of the NSA, they can monitor billions of people around the world. So where the Stasi was one, one police informer for every six people, we now have one NSA employee for every 200,000 people. That's the skill with which they can monitor. And they can sweep up everything. So what the Stasi tried to do, the U.S. is now doing and has the capability to do. So uh, Snowden has shown the world exactly what that means, how extensive that is, how pervasive, how much they can penetrate into our homes, our offices, our computers, our bedrooms. I mean, the Fourth Amendment is, is, uh, has become totally antiquated in the minds of, of people who want that degree of surveillance. Well, I'd like to open it up to the audience now. Um, so I'll hand the microphone off, unless you have further general statements to make. No, no, no. no. OK. This is a question for both of you. Do you feel that perhaps we've outsourced our compassion to technology? Or do you think it's more driven by human desires? I'm thinking more about convenience. It seems to be more convenient just to pass it off to an algorithm to figure out who's a bad guy, who's a good guy, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Compassion uh, also implies for me the word suffering. Uh, we've given out a lot of suffering, and we're suffering. But uh, it's easy, of course. Greed drives power. Power says we want, we want control, and we want to rule the world. It's easier to do without boots on the ground. It's far easier to use drones and NSA. And this, by the way, this psychology of dominance. But as we went into chapter 10, you know, the space war is very serious. Alfred McCoy has written extensively about it and very perceptively. This is serious business from 150 miles out now, within a few years, this uh, new development. It's very scary. Uh, that, of course, as, we're, as we have militarized ourselves uh, to this nth degree, we've also, the planet is in jeopardy of destroying itself because of you know, carbon and the, the emission of the gases. It's just, uh, so it's like, it's, just, it's a race between domination and at the same time end of the world uh, uh, technology, end of the world weather. It's uh, curious. Uh, as a dramatist, I'm sticking around. You know, I like uh, I like to see the end of this thing. It's a great story. <laughs> but remember, drama is based in compassion. The greatness of drama, unlike history, history, unfortunately, the uh, the Greek dramatists were were predominant before the Greek historians. Herodotus came along after Sophocles, Aeschylus, and around the time of Euripides. Greek dramatists understood what was at stake here. The Iliad and the Odyssey is a great story to me, because Homer, whoever he was, he was a dramatist. He wasn't a historian. You know, we, we don't know exactly, but he told the story, and that's what dramatists could do. They understand the cost of history. Sometimes these historians, these motherfuckers that exist today, and I include Sean Willens among them, and that kind of a liberal uh, mentality. It's all about excusing the United States. None of them are writing honestly about how evil we can be. And that's where this compassion, you have to understand what the enemy is suffering. You have to start with things like Vietnam or 
the Soviet Union in World War II. Once you understand the suffering of others, you can begin to understand history, not before. And, and let me get back to that question, too, because you talked about technology and the effects of technology. We're perfecting that now in a, an entirely new way. Uh, and a dehumanizing way, as Oliver says, when those drone operators uh, register kills in Yemen and Pakistan, they refer to them as bug splats. You know, to, to them, these are human beings. To the Times Square bomber, those are human beings. To our drone operators, those are bug splats. But the technology is an issue that goes way back in history. Mary Shelley was warning about this in Frankenstein in 1818. Um, one of the key moments for us we all talk, especially in the book, but also one of the other episodes we added, about the gas warfare, the poison warfare during World War I. But the, a key turning point for us is Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? Atomic bombings <coughs> that were neither militarily necessary or morally justifiable. And, and that was a turning point. When we could justify the wiping out of those <coughs> cities, hundreds of thousands of people, but also beginning a process that Truman and others knew could lead to the annihilation of our species for some threat that we wanted to pose to the Soviet Union at that point, we can get into more detail, that was a major turning point in human history. And now we began, from that point on, we living with the possibility of extinction in a way we had not before that. And now we've perfected it. The, the American warfare now is no longer armies and boots on the ground. We might get to that again, but uh, that's not what we're doing now. It's between surveillance, special operations. Our special operations forces now are operating in 134 different countries. And they're cheap compared to what they were. We, our special operations budget is about $10 billion. The war in Iraq costs, the estimates are by The Economist, uh, $3 trillion. So we can accomplish that same hegemony and global domination with $10 billion now that we wasted $3 trillion uh, using in Iraq. And so, so there's Technology is allowing a different kind of domination, but as we say there, the question is the race. Is technology sufficient? We thought it was sufficient in Vietnam. We couldn't believe, as, as Kissinger says, that that fourth-rate little piss-ass country could defeat us. But Oliver knows he was there. Uh, technology is, we have a myth about technology and a fantasy that our technology makes us invincible, and that's not true. I was there today to listen to you uh, at the uh, conference, yeah. so I uh, wanted to congratulate you on not practicing political segregation. So, um, we've had 67 empires in the last 3,000 years, and it's a car without a reverse. So no one's backed off this plank. Um, in your remarks uh, today, I was interested in you, your comparison between Obama and Kennedy, that personality matters. and, and uh, since we're not going to um, be defeatist here, what um, can you talk a little about uh, leadership and uh, the role of personality in, um, in, in well, history as biography? Yeah, you know, we say in these series, and I think Kennedy, I, 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 you say personality, I would say character. There is a, a character is takes shape over time. Personality seems to me sometimes to, to is a is more superficial than character. Uh, Kennedy, uh, like Roosevelt, Roosevelt was in a, a polio, uh, certainly changed, must have changed his thinking. You know, he was always a certain kind of man, but it deepened in his commitment to life. And, and uh, I love his last comment to Stalin, that, that was the last day of his life. You know, that's a very important statement, and I think it's true that soft power, accommodation, is the solution, and it keeps, we keep forgetting that. People always in the newspapers, they always talk about mandates and being tough and heading your point. And they always, you know, whenever you compromise or try to, to be a diplomat, it's a harder game because you never get any attention or praise for it. Diplomacy is very rarely praised. And there is also, with Kennedy, you have a man who actually was in that horrible uh, PT-109 story, which we know a movie was made about it, but he did save lives. He was under fire. He had responsibility as a lieutenant commander, a young man. And uh, the amazing thing is that all these World War II generals, most of them, were so arrogant by 1960. They had lost that uh, humility that they had 
World War II brought the United States victory, and victory is its own enemy, as uh, Musty said. You know, victory does not teach a lesson to the winners; it only teaches it to the losers. These guys were so arrogant about Korea and angry about the communist threat that by Vietnam they were looking for Vietnam, they were looking for Cuba, they were looking for Laos. They wanted to really prove a point to them so that we were the dominant player here. And Kennedy is a young punk. That's why I think it was called that by several of them in you know, this new book that revealed a lot. Arlie Burke was a tough naval commander, and we know that LeVay was very hard, as well as Thomas Power. These guys were ruthless, and, and they, behind, they were saying things to Kennedy that no commander would say. It was only out of that arrogance, World War II. I ran into that in Vietnam. A lot of my sergeants, master sergeants, were World War II vets. Most of them were worthless in the field, worthless, because they never went to the field. You know, they figured out the system, they stayed back, they got the money, the perks, the, the PX clubs. General Westmoreland, I saw him once, I mean, he was the epitome of the problem. Uh, a stupid general from World War II who was fighting the Germans or something, who did not understand the Oriental uh, mindset that they were fighting for their lives, for their country, for their land. Anyway, uh, Kennedy had character. I cannot see Obama. I cannot conceive of Obama at that moment in time with Eisenhower calling him and telling him to go and, and uh, Dean Acheson, the guy he had admired for some reason, telling him to go and all these advisors in the military, go, go, go. He said no. Him and his brother locked up. And it's a great story. The greatest I know because I think we all have been affected. And uh, we forget this. We keep forgetting it. That's what's so sad about history. We forget any more than we forget that Stalin, no matter how we hate him, defeated the, the Nazis. And if he hadn't, and if he declared a peace in 43 or something, he said, I'm not going further east. I'm, I'm not going further west into Germany. You handle it, Churchill. You handle it, Roosevelt. And fuck you. <laughs> we would have had a million US casualties, minimum. And the British also. And we, we, we forget these simple things. You know, is there anyone in this room? Your fathers and grandfathers would have been affected by that decision. We don't, we're not grateful. Hello, Mark. This is it. Your turn. <laughs> Character counts. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, and we were discussing it this afternoon, as you know. And we were there, we did an event with Jeremy Scahill, who's fabulous. But, and Jeremy was arguing a much more structural approach than we were. The military industrial complex is going to determine things no matter which president is in there. And we use the example of Kennedy, but there are a lot of other examples. People saw images of Henry Wallace here today. I would imagine a lot of you don't know who Henry Wallace is. When I ask my students, most of them have never heard of Henry Wallace. He's been effectively written out of history. But he was Roosevelt's vice president from 1940 to 1944. And he was a true visionary. And Wallace, uh, Roosevelt put him on the ticket because he knew we were about to fight a war against fascism. And Wallace was the leading anti-fascist. Wallace was also the leading progressive. So when Henry Luce gives his famous speech in 1941, saying the 20th century must be the American century, the United States is going to dominate the world in every way, Wallace responds and says, no, the 20th century must be the century of the common man. And he calls for a worldwide people's revolution. Can you imagine an American vice president calling for a worldwide people's re revolution? He says, modeled after the French, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, and the Latin American revolutions. He had this vision ending monopolies, ending imperialism, ending colonialism. Uh, and he was obviously very radical, and the party bosses wanted to get him off the ticket in 1944, because they knew that Roosevelt was not going to last another term. But he was very popular. In fact, when Gallup did a poll on the opening night of the Democratic Convention in 1944, 65% of potential voters said they wanted Wallace back on the ticket as vice president. 2% said they wanted Truman. Uh, and that, that's an interesting story how that happened. But had Claude Pepper gotten five more feet to the microphone that night, less than this distance, uh, and, and gotten Wallace's name and nomination as he was trying to do before they cut off the meeting at the convention, then Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president. He would become president in 1945 instead of Truman. And we believe there would have been no atomic bombings in 1945, and very possibly the entire Cold War could have been averted. So people do make a difference. But there's up against tremendous odds and difficulties, and it takes 
courage. As Oliver was saying about Kennedy, our concern is that had Obama been president in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis instead of Kennedy, then there was we've almost no doubt he would have caved in to the military advisors, the political advisors, like he did in Afghanistan, and we would have uh, bombed and invaded, and nuclear war would have started. We had no idea what we, we were going to confront there, and much of the world would have been destroyed. And a lot of the, uh, my point, I didn't finish it, was a lot of the compassion comes from suffering. And I was talking about that as a dramatist, too. The Kennedy and Roosevelt suffered because the back problems that Kennedy had, the pain that he was in, and he also had uh, other issues with his the back, the Addison's disease. I mean, that does weather a man. And I think that makes his outlook far more empathetic to other people. And Roosevelt had that. So I, I, Reagan, on the other hand, seems to have lived like a happy doodle dandy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> go home from the office at five o'clock and have his cupcakes with Nancy or a TV dinner and watch the fake news. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I do think that Obama has the same problem. He went to Harvard Law School. I knew we were in trouble when he came to Harvard Law Review. Anybody who runs the Harvard Law Review is, is, you know, this guy is a constitutional lawyer, as Jeremy was saying. Look, look at he's trashed the Constitution. No, something is really wrong. <laughs> and I don't think uh, George Bush, the father, either had much uh, suffering in his life. He seems to have had it, as Ann Richards said, born with a silver foot in his mouth. Although <laughs> <laughs> he was a war hero. <laughs> Nixon's suffering was internal and of his own choosing. <laughs> Hi, uh, um, um, I'm William Powell. You I'm um, from Inside Acting Radio. False. And I had a question for both of y'all about the grade that you would give Obama in foreign policy, what grade would you give him? Grade in foreign policy? I mean, F. <laughs> F. Uh, he, uh, you know, Colin Powell should have uh, wanted that nomination, never got it. But uh, they're the same man, you know, he is Colin Powell. What do you think? <laughs> give a D minus or what? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I would see a certain places where he's actually not deserved an F, but maybe a D minus. <laughs> uh, he did get us out of Iraq. Okay, now, it was an agreement that Bush had signed in terms of our, our leaving Iraq. But he wanted to stay, but, but he wouldn't accept the conditions. Right, wouldn't, yes. So, so we give him a little bit of credit for that. Um, he is finally winding down, cut the troop deployment in Afghanistan. It's a terribly unpopular war. It doesn't take a lot of courage to do that now, given how unpopular Afghanistan is. What a fiasco. Did you see that national intelligence estimate that just came out? It said whether we keep those eight to 12,000 troops there or not, by 2017, anything we've achieved there is going to be lost. Uh, I mean, the situation is an absolute disaster there. The situation in Iraq is a disaster. What we've unleashed in that part of the world, but this goes way back. You know, as we, we show uh, in earlier episodes, Afghanistan really begins in the 1970s when Brzezinski is so proud of himself for suckering the Soviets in because we created a situation we knew they were going to have to send troops in and Brzezinski crows, we've given Russia, Soviet Union, its own Vietnam. And, and, and who were we supporting then in Afghanistan? Not only were we supporting the crazies, the reason why the uh, Afghans hated the Russians more than anything else was the Russians were giving rights to women. And the people we were supporting were the ones who wanted to deny all rights to women in Afghanistan. I mean, the, the, the worst of, of the misogynist, crazy fundamentalists, as one RAND expert who was married to the U.S. ambassador, said the reason why there are no moderates in Afghanistan is because we let all the nuts loose there and supported them and armed them and trained them, and they killed all the moderates. That's why we're in a situation now where a country with life expectancy of 46 country where 10% of army recruits are literate. I mean, the situation there is, is terrible, and we waste $110 billion a year. So what do we say for Obama's foreign policy? <laughs> uh, maybe in some ways a little bit better than Bush, but in some ways worse, because this killing machine that he's created, and what, he's, what he bragged and was reported in the Halpern Heilman book, Obama says, I'm really good at killing people. <laughs> you know, and, and this is, he's proud of this. So on the one hand, he has this facade, this veneer of being this humane person, and he's certainly intelligent uh, and articulate, and he can give great speeches, but what, we don't know, we, we know there's no backbone. We don't know if there's any heart. We haven't seen much sign of it. 
Hi, um, Peter or Oliver. I just wanted to see, my name's Laura Lovelace, hello. <clears throat> Is there anything positive that we can take away from um, Obama's um, not taking us into Syria, you know, at, especially after Putin came at him pretty hard in terms of, of bashing him in the New York Times editorial and all of these things that you typically think about, you know, ego and saving face and and Kerry had just been up on the hill. I don't know. It's it's too much to say anything's changing, I guess, but is, is there anything even incremental we can look to? I'd just like to add one thing. I mean, we can't, you know, Obama, as he said, there is intelligence there. He's not stupid. But, and I think he's got a little, some guts insofar as he's the first president in a long time to stand up to AIPAC and the Israeli lobby in this country. I mean, there's pressure on Iran, uh, which he joined, and he, he did, he was involved in the Stuxnet attack, the um, cyber attack on Iran, which is illegal and all that. But I mean, he did, he's holding off, and I think he's facing enormous pressure from Netanyahu and the Saudis now, which is amazing, of course, the Saudi Arabians have been up to no good for so long, and our, and our, they, they deserve a special place in the Hall of Shame. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Israel has uh, really, uh, you know, Syria is part of that too, and, I'm, and it's, it's part of the equation, it's part of the Saudi equation. I think uh, Obama is very confused by it, and it's, uh, I think, my point, I, I don't quite always agree with Peter, but I feel that if, even if Congress had voted no and the Russians had done nothing, I do think he would have gone in. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my feeling, because I think he would have defied Congress. But you want, you're welcome to you answer that to Syria, if there's good hopes there. I mean, it's, what I like, the point I was making before is that it shows that a coalition of the left and the libertarian right can actually affect policy. The public mood, public opinion was so strongly against the U.S. bombing of Syria. When was the last time you can remember public <coughs> opinion being act opposed to U.S. bombing? The Americans are not only war weary, but, but they're, they're, they learn some lessons, but they learn it slow. For example, lessons. One of the ones, why we, why we talk about history. One of the things that we were both involved in on different sides at certain points was Vietnam. Oliver was there, volunteered, because he believed what he was learning in school <laughs> at that point. He dropped out of Yale to volunteer. How many kids went from Yale were fighting in, in Vietnam? Or Harvard, next to none. Oliver believed in it and he went. I was an anti-war activist throughout that period. But we think we learned lessons from Vietnam, right? But the latest polling shows that 51% of 18 to 29 year olds in this country believe that Vietnam was worth fighting. 51%. And Obama has now announced a 13 year commemoration of Vietnam. And he's talking about it having been a noble cause. Uh, it, we, but but what, is, what is the reality of Vietnam? Because I ask my students all the time, how many Americans died in the war? And they, some of them know 58,000. They can guess close to that sometimes. I ask them, how many Vietnamese died in the war? And they have no idea. And the answers I get, sometimes 100,000, sometimes half a million. Some might know a million. And I tell them, and then I ask them also, how many Jews died in the Holocaust? And usually all the hands go up, six million, they, they can say. Uh, but uh, I tell him that when Robert McNamara came into my class, he told them that told the students that he believes that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in the war. Uh, they think a half million, and, and the actual number is 3.8 million. What does that say to us about what we know? If they know how many were killed by the Germans in the Holocaust. They have no idea what were killed by their own country. You look at the Vietnam Memorial. Okay, the Vietnam Memorial is 246 feet long. It's got the names of 58,272 Americans who died. The message of the Vietnam Memorial is that the tragedy of Vietnam is that 58,272 Americans died. What if we added the names of the 3.8 million Vietnamese, the uh, million La Laotians, Cambodians, the, the Brits and the Aussies and others who, who fought and died? The memorial would actually be, instead of 246 feet long, it would be over four miles long. Now that to me would be a war memorial, and that would make a statement. Oliver and I were in Okinawa this summer, and if you go to the Okinawa, uh, Okinawa War Memorial, you see it has the names of the Americans, the Japanese, the Okinawans, the Brits, the Aussies, and that's making a statement. That would be, 
a very, very different statement than the Vietnam War, so which, why we're stressing the importance of understanding history. Good evening. I just like to say, first of all, that the tremendous series and the uh, book that you wrote, you've done a tremendous service to this country. Tremendous. <laughs> My concern is where do we go next? Um, Obama, to <laughs> paraphrase recent comments by former Representative Cynthia McKinney, Mr. Obama is a disgrace and an insult to the tradition of principal African-American leaders, such as Frederick Douglass, uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, Malcolm X, um, Adam Clayton Powell, and certainly Dr. King. None of these people would have approved of his, um, of his conduct. I don't think he's a man who has a core of decency in him. I haven't seen it. Initially, when he, before he ran, when he was a senator, I, started, I didn't like him because of comments he made about Bush nominating John Roberts to head the Supreme Court. But I got sucked up into the hype, like, every, like many other black people did and other Americans, and I ended up voting for him the first time. After a few weeks of him being in office, I knew I had been right the first time because of the people with whom he surrounded himself. Mm -hmm. Larry Summers and all the people in Goldman Sachs when he'll probably join Goldman Sachs when he leaves office. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, um, I just, I think the powers that be, whoever cleared him or enabled him to run, nailed it. Because what they did, he silenced the anti-war movement he created divisions within relationships among families, among white people, where if you say anything against him, I have to be very careful <laughs> the company that I'm in, even within my own family. My parents are dead, they would have understood, and I could have talked with them about it, but the very few people I can talk, so I'm venting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm venting right now, but he's fractured the black community, he's fractured dissent. Um, I don't know, we have to become a compassionate country and as an African-American woman, I don't know that America's ever been compassionate, not really. We had a real chance under Henry Wallace. And I have to tell you also, when I read the chapter, um, Bush and Obama, I feel things very deeply, I cried. Mm. And everyone I know who's read the book, it's, it's, our history is very, very sad and very, very tragic and we have to develop our humanity as a people, embrace each other, not that we all can get along. We have to, we have to change. We have, we're living in a country, we are hated by the rest of the world. I mean, I was in, uh, you're in positions, uh, in situations with foreign people and foreign countries. I can't defend what happens here, what is done in our name. Uh, in 2000, after, before the invasion of Iraq, I was one of the people out there marching. And you know that Oliver tried to make a movie about Martin Luther King yeah, that was focusing that. on that later period of his life when King's view was becoming mm -hmm. much more radical. Because that's, that's you know, all of Martin Luther King's life was exemplary, but the Martin Luther King, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, who, said, who warned that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, is not the Martin Luther King who many people wanted Oliver to portray. The radical king who had evolved, much like Jack Kennedy evolved in office, Martin Luther King evolved throughout his life. And Martin Luther King who was assassinated is not the same I have a dream Martin Luther King who the kids celebrate in the schools. <laughs> so you get, we settled for the Time Magazine cover from 65, but we don't want to explore what happened after 65. Adultery included. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, it's okay with me, you know. <laughs> what makes the man great is his character, mm -hmm. as the same with Jack Kennedy, character. And we all have flaws sometimes. If you can make the comments or the uh, questions brief, that's helpful because we have limited time. This gentleman. Hi, Carl Golovic. Uh, Andrew Jackson probably had 
the most backbone of any American president we can think of. He shut down the Second Bank of the U.S. and stated that the Constitution was intended to provide a circulating gold and silver coin to protect the wealth of the laboring class from being inflated away. And I think we've learned that the Federal Reserve and its unlimited credit is sort of the engine driving our military conquest. And, of course, the libertarian perspective tends to align itself with ending the Fed. Yeah. In regards to John Kennedy, for 50 years we've been trained to celebrate or commemorate his death every year. His birthday is May 29th, and I'd like to ask your opinion of the idea of making it a global day in recognition of John Kennedy, of, and to focus on, on ending secrecy in government uh, by honoring him, uh, calling the CIA back to its original intelligence-only mandate, and uh, while well, restoring our constitutional republic. Uh, if I could mention the, the web domain, honorjfk.com uh, focuses on that idea. Thank you. It's a great thought. Great to have a John F. Kennedy. I would look to your left when you ask for questions from audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Ushma Parikh, and um, I wanted to know, do you think it's even possible in the political climate that we have right now, and also with the mass media representation of um, political candidates, as well as the public's um, distorted views provided by all of the information that we have for somebody with that courage of character to become a leader in this country. And then also, if it takes compassion and understanding and empathy to kind of um, have a movement, and there's a movement of empathy starting in this country among civil society, as well as Ariana Huffington and David Brooks have talked about it, if, um, if it takes that to um, and you know the the cycle of violence that we're in is that some how can we get that empathy and that compassion and understanding into the political leaders that we have in this country at this Take time? Take out the money from politics. That's one <laughs> yeah. thing we can do. We start right there. Uh, make the uh, public servants public servants in the sense mm -hmm. that they would serve honorably and they would be pensioned down and that would be wonderful. But uh, that said, it's becoming increasingly difficult in a corrupt empire. Mm -hmm. The Roman Empire comes to mind, how difficult it was to have good emperors after a certain period of time. I mean, when Kennedy was killed in 63, it was for me, as I tried to show in the film I made, a momentous turning point. There was an announcement to me, or many people, that there was a hidden secret government in this country and it was running the show. And that there would be no individual mandates allowed, such as what Kennedy brought. When Carter and Roosevelt, of course, uh, was one of the strongest we had in this century. And then, uh, and Teddy, too, in his own way, although he was an imperialist. But uh, later on, when Carter started to make those moves, it's a very interesting, we go into it in, in depth. Uh, Brzezinski really, uh, and Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, the way they, they cut him off at the pass is fascinating. Clinton has a similar story with his gay, uh, the gay military thing, started backfired on him heavily, as well as, of course, his health uh, initiative. So these, they both get changed. I mean, they both were muzzled by forces such as Nixon, too. When Nixon went towards detente with Russia and China, uh, Watergate kicks in. There's, 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 there's a certain thing that happens to these presidents. They get choked off. It's very hard after these amount of years. Kennedy was killed 50 years ago to uh, change the course of empire. And one hopes for Gorbachev. I really think the Soviet Union of 1980 must be studied. I was there, by the way, making it, writing a script about dissonance. But what Gorbachev did, he came out of that system. And it was so rotten, so corrupt, and he knew it, that he was able to say, we need to reform or we're gonna die. And he was absolutely right. Perhaps we would reach a degree of corruption like a, where a Julian, would step, a Julian the Apostate or a, a Constantine in his own crazy Christian way would step forward and maybe possibly uh, change this. But it would have to come from within or else it'll come from without. China may play a role here because of its, I believe, creative construction. Is China has very been very adaptive and it never has a historic does not have a history of foreign overseas aggression. It does not. Uh, the Chinese immigrate. They they send people abroad in large <laughs> quantities and they actually integrate into society and they have a terrific work ethic and they they work for the betterment of that society. It's an interesting concept. 
So, uh, one, the, you know, these things will change. The barbarians came to Rome. The Chinese may very well have a strong influence in the way we develop as a society, if we can lick the global pollution problem, which is a huge issue. But aside from that, uh, we hope, we hope, but I am very, very, uh, if we stick with the media we have now and the Wall Street we have now and the Congress we have now, we will never fucking come out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we're dying, we're strangled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a fine dramatist, I'd like to also compliment you tonight, because after all, we saw a film uh, on the visuals. Um, I really appreciate, because I do it too, is you use so much feature footage, and how feature footage also represents, I think, like archival. Could you talk a little bit about the process? Did you do the writing first? Then the visuals came, or I, you know. Well, we were always looking for shortcuts because we have 58 minutes and 30 seconds to do uh, basically a decade in some of these cases, and we have to really move and keep keep to the big picture. In so doing, it occurred to us that let's use movies because they're fun, and they also break up some of that narration and break up the sometimes the tedium. Let's say looking at a lot of archive footage, no matter how good it is, it can become tiring. We're also dealing with trying to get to 17, 18 year olds, you know, like my daughter, who <laughs> hasn't seen the whole thing yet. But uh, <laughs> you know, by putting movies in, you, but movies of the time that are pertinent, they're whether they're, for they or, they're pro our message or against our message. I mean, when I put 12 O'Clock High in with Gregory Peck for Curtis LeMay, it's a very stirring scene, but in reality, uh, LeMay's insane. And, we, uh, and, uh, you know, and, so, and Gregory Peck doesn't know that he's playing an insane man. He tells the guys, you, I want you all to go out there and ready to die, you know. It's, uh, it reminded me of Joseph Heller's Catch-22, if you want to know about the bombardiers. But yeah, you get the point. Films speak, cut through, and they break it up, break up the monotony. So we used, uh, what, 60, 70 films, I guess, pieces of clips. Thank you. What, in this chapter, did we have uh, I Star what was it. Wars? Star Wars, yeah. Well, you know, that's Mr. a very Smith, powerful Mr. image. Smith, Mr. Smith, yeah. Dark 30. And Homeland. Homeland, yeah. Meet John Doe. No, the CIA, after my film, they really knew that they blundered. They went, because they'd gone into the publishing, uh, book publishing, and the media business heavily in the 50s, controlling it as much as they could. They, they said, well, we haven't really been paying enough attention to film. And I think after JFK, they really came down. They set up an office. It's in uh, James DiGinio's book, uh, Reclaiming Parkland. He goes into the details of how they set up the office in Hollywood. And it paid off. I mean, some of all fears, uh, Tom Clancy books, the, uh, they cooperated with Alias, the Jennifer Garner thing, again, bringing the CIA back into a positive image. Think about 24, which is a disgusting, very successful, hugely successful view of the American fighting uh, homegrown terrorism and the border. And of course, Homeland. Now, Homeland, if you look closely at it, you'll see Iran is always a background for bad guys as well as Venezuela. <laughs> uh, the Black Hawk Down, you will see the American US military technology, wor the worship of technology is, is evident in Black, the, the Apache helicopters and so forth, the Black Hawk, as well as in Pearl Harbor, you'll see enormous usage of Pentagon approvals, as well as uh, Osama bin Laden, and even in Argo. I mean, Argo is a story about Canadians who <laughs> this, uh, we make it a, into a very stirring American movie. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to be very careful. It is culture, and John Wayne had a huge influence. Those of you who are too young to remember. John, Ron Covet, Born on the Fourth of July, myself, we were influenced by Wayne. It was him against the bad guys, the Indians, the uh, a lot of Indians, the bad guys in the Westerns, and of course the commies. The commies. Like Gary Cooper in High Noon was my example. Gary Cooper in High Noon, yeah. Or Grace Kelly's degree. <laughs> High Noon's uh, ambiguous to me. I didn't use that because uh, uh, it has a. Uh, well, we should talk about that somewhere else. It's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mike. Oh, Mark. I love Mark. Is a, Mark Weisbrand has uh, worked with me on uh, South of the Border. He's with the Institute of Economic Policy and Research here in Washington, an expert on South America and many other things, economic. Thanks, Oliver. I, you know, I think it's great in the book, of course, too. And I, I really appreciate that you're trying to change how people see history because they obviously have to learn from it. And 
I just want to inject maybe a possible more uh, note of optimism for this kind of a chapter because I do think even since this chapter a lot of things you know important things have happened uh, and you know even though our leadership doesn't change very much uh, they're increasingly constrained both by the rest of the world and by uh, internal uh, dissent and so you know you have of course they lost uh, all, almost all of South America most of Latin America uh, which is a huge development. But they haven't given up. Uh, they, they haven't given up, but they're not getting anywhere. They just lost two more elections of a week ago, two couple of weeks ago in, in Salvador and Costa Rica. And uh, there, um, you know, you had three defeats for APAC, which was supposedly, which you mentioned, which is supposedly invincible, one of them with Obama on their side in Syria, which was the first time in my life that I've ever seen a war being stopped before it started. Um, they're losing, uh, they can't get anywhere in the WTO for 15, uh, for nearly 20 years. They, uh, they can't get money for the IMF through Congress for the first time ever. They can't get, Obama can't get the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is not just a commercial agreement, it's a very imperial uh, project that seeks to isolate uh, China and also divide Latin America between the, uh, the good kids and the bad kids is really important to them. They can't get anywhere on that. They're getting rebellion from their own party, from Harry Reid, uh, from everyone else. They really are, and, and it's because the world has changed. And both, uh, I mean, more outside of the United States, but also here, the, you know, you look at the polling data, it's not just they don't like these wars. They think they, we shouldn't have even gone into Iraq in the first place, you know, majorities. Majorities of Republicans are giving answers like this. So, yeah, you know, and, and I think that in some sense we're in a time where, you know, these kind of movements are weak because the economy is such a big focus. That is, when you have, uh, you know, this kind of uh, economic catastrophe we have the last few years, people are very, very much more, much less likely. When this economy starts to recover, and, and it will eventually, uh, and it already has, but I mean, it will recover, uh, you're going to see. Um, you're going to see even more attention to uh, foreign policy, and and it's going to be the same uh, direction that it's, it's going. I love you, Mark. You're so. <laughs> yeah. You're Henry Wallace come to bat. <laughs> uh, he's a vegan. Uh, he, he, he lives uh, with his he eats his rice bowl out of his backpack. And he has his bicycles everywhere. This is a character. This is a character. We need more Americans like Mark Wise. And we will turn this fucker around. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I like what you did with Bush and Nixon, and I wondered if you have any interest in pursuing Obama as a subject for a film. Frankly, not at all. I much more. He has no backbone. There's nothing there. As a lady, as a, I mean, it's sad. But uh, I'm really interested. If I had to do a presidential portrait, I think LBJ is the, is the psycho of all time. <laughs> Really interesting character. What a drinker and what a story. And of course, he betrayed the Kennedy dream, in my opinion, except for the civil rights thing, which I don't think, I mean, he did get it through, thank God, but I think Kennedy's dad did play a role in getting it through. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan's fascinating because, uh, like Bush, the, the 43rd, he's very shallow, but it's fascinating shallow. And the way he had mommy at home five o'clock, you know, to make him his TV dinner every night. It's a great fantasy in the way, I mean, in the book we have so many anecdotes of Reagan, the way he spoke about things, uh, uh, you know, uh, his jokes about the Soviet Union. It was pretty hairy, actually, if, you, if you're old enough to remember 83. I remember the Korean uh, jetliner, and it's very close, and when we, we discovered in the book, we, we came much closer than we ever knew during that period. And uh, also with Yeltsin, we came very close, but Reagan and uh, LBJ stand out to me uh, as, uh, but I don't know that I would ever have time to go back there now at this age. But Johnson does take the cake. <laughs> and I think Robert Caro, I mean, this is such a, this is like history machinated to death. I mean, you can, he just avoids everything that's dark about LBJ, it's really dark. But if you read it carefully, you can actually discern some important things. One of the things that's very little known in this country is that Kennedy was had said to people that he was going to oust LBJ from the ticket yeah. in 1964. And the week that Kennedy was assassinated was the week that the indictment was going to come down. Bobby Baker was in the Senate. Yeah, Bobby Baker, who was uh, 
LBJ was his mentor, and LBJ was involved in a lot of that corruption that Bobby Baker went to jail for. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were several scandals involving LBJ, and, he, and Kennedy was about to drop him, announce that he was going to drop him from the ticket, according to Kennedy's secretary, that week. Uh, so. To replace him with who? There was talk of the guy from Florida, Smathers. George Smathers. I think we have time for two more questions. Way in the back there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Bernstein, and I too am intrigued by this uh, strange bedfellows of the, the far left and the libertarian right. But what concerns me is the movement in this country to, and the, the uh, opinion that's taking over that demonizes anything that comes out of the New Deal and the Great Society from a domestic standpoint. And the libertarian movement really seems to be instilling this, uh, this message that any sort of government safety net or government involvement is bad and uh, incompetent. And although I am optimistic by the uh, modest uh, successes of foreign policy with this new alliance in a sense, I'm worried about this uh, where it's going with the domestic policy. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Reagan, uh, it's ironic to me, as an outsider, not as a historian, that Reagan was a new is uh, benefited from the New Deal. Uh, and uh, he ended up being the one who actually destroyed uh, any uh, affinity for the New Deal. He, he, he took the whole vocabulary and he shifted it in a way that it was impossible to resurrect the old thoughts about what helping others and uh, after him the dialogue with Clinton it was easier for Clinton to do what he did to do the welfare state and it's never come back even with Obama I mean uh, to me so the New Deal is, is, is gone I mean the Americans will no longer tolerate that a revisit to that and Reagan took care of that so this whole country has changed for 30 some years but at least you know take it for what it's worth he's right it's a grain of salt but Remember, the uh, eavesdropping, uh, the Patriot Act was almost overturned in that moment by a few votes. So there's still hope that that new alliance can actually yield a, a beginning of a peeling back of a military. Once you start to peel back the military state that we have in any form, a lot flows from that. And a lot, and maybe we'll fight about economic domestic spending, but there'll be more money to go around. Uh, let, let me take a crack at that also. Uh, the Occupy movement was a very hopeful beginning for me. And that this was a movement that saw a very positive role for government. I probably place more blame on Bill Clinton than Oliver does, and on Hillary Clinton, being on the board at Walmart, among other things. Uh, I mean, we're, we're very critical of Hillary Clinton. We see her, as we mentioned in that episode, as a very dangerous hawk, mm -hmm. somebody who not only author gave authorization to Bush to invade <laughs> Iraq, I pressured Obama to increase the troops in Afghanistan when he was resisting with, and pressured by Biden to go the other way. Hillary Clinton was one of the ones who pushed him in that direction, supported the invasion of Libya, supported the bombing of Syria. I mean, I don't know which war she's ever seen that she didn't like, maybe a little bit of Vietnam at one early point. Um, so she's very hawkish, but she ha on her domestic policies, along the lines you're talking, she's not so bad generally. Uh, but we need to have a much more positive view of government again. What we have now is a government of corruption. Our elections are bribery. When, when it costs a billion dollars to get a president elected, Obama's got to go around asking for money from the Wall Street interests, from the pharmaceutical companies. The fact that the pharmaceutical, Big Pharma had always supported the Republicans overwhelmingly, but then they gave to Obama three to one, it's not a surprise we got the health care plan that we have rather than even what Obama admitted we needed, which was a single-payer system. But the attitude toward government is negative, but I see it shifting. Uh, we mentioned there the disproportion in wealth, but the actual numbers that recently came out are even worse. We just learned that the richest 85 people in the world have more wealth than the poorest 3.5 billion. So the gap is even worse. Even in the United States, the six Walmart heirs have more wealth than the bottom 30% of the population. Uh, the richest 1% are more wealth than the bottom 90% in the United States. So I think there's that kind of potential to actually spark a movement that's going to have a more positive view about government, not as a great killing machine, 
but government as actually providing the help that people need.